four o'clock time, but I just wanted to say a few things and then we can do our uh, official introduction here. Um, but I want to say welcome. Uh, uh, I'm really excited to see so many folks showing up for this event. Uh, this is the second event in a series that's being done this fall here at OSU, uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the original series of Star Trek on network TV. And so my name is Joseph Orozco, and I'm a professor in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion. And I'm also the co-director of, of the Anares Project for Alternative Futures. Uh, Anares Project is a forum that's housed in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion. And what we have been trying to do for the past three or so years that we have been here at OSU is to be a forum to create discussions about alternatives to current status quo situations in the world today. So what we're trying to do is to engender conversations having to do with themes that are inspired by the speculative fiction work of Ursula K. Le Guin. So those of you who know her novel, The Dispossessed, will recognize the name Anares. And we take as inspiration some of the themes that she discusses in her work, which are uh, uh, trying to imagine a future uh, opposed to things like oppression, war, violence, uh, and various forms of injustices. And so we are uh, trying to create a forum for those kinds of discussions here at OSU. And so we've decided that part of our interest is in discussing and bringing to a discussion uh, about dystopias and utopias. So in the past uh, year, we've had a class in philosophy about uh, lo looking at the notion of utopian, dystopian social justice. And as part of this series for Star Trek, we have a class uh, in fall, and some of my students are here, Star Trek and philosophy, trying to investigate classic themes of uh, philosophy through the medium of Star Trek. And so this is a series that we put together trying to look at this landmark science fiction franchise and trying to understand the sort of deeper meanings that this series holds, the cultural and technological and political impacts that this has made in our everyday lives, and also to talk about the ways in which it has influenced our notion of the future and given us hope for a different kind of world and what that might be and what are the forms of struggle that we might have to engage in here in terms of our social justice movements to move us towards a much brighter future. And so uh, we have posters that indicate some of the events that uh, we're putting together this fall. And I just wanted to really highlight a, a few of them for uh, you for next week to hope to invite you. So next week, uh, we're very excited to be able to invite and to host here on campus the Trek Theater of Eugene, Oregon. So Trek Theater, some of you may have heard about Trek in the Park in Portland. Uh, it even made an episode of Portlandia at one point. Uh, for many, for about five years or so, there was a theater troupe called Atomic Arts in Portland, and what they did is, they, on a yearly basis, would do Trek in the Park, sort of like Shakespeare in the Park in New York City. They would perform episodes of the original series, and uh, their uh, performances were, if any, did any of you ever go to any of those Trek in the Park in Portland? Really well done, right? Uh, and uh, you start to realize that these uh, scripts were very theatrical in a way, it really lended themselves to that kind of performance. There is a troupe now in Eugene called Trek Theater, and for the past three so years, they have been performing here in Corvallis and Eugene and in other places in Oregon, um, episodes uh, largely from uh, the next generation of Star Trek, uh, but they have also done a new creative work that they've uh, premiered this year, a musical based on uh, Star Trek, and they performed that uh, here in Corvallis in September to honor the 50th anniversary. They will be here in Corvallis in this building next week on Thursday night, uh, October 20th, at 7 p.m. to give a performance of the Star Trek Next Generation episode, The Drumhead. And following our themes, The Drumhead is an episode that investigates the tension between the maintenance of state security and protection against terrorists versus the protection of human rights. And so it's a very sort of engaging episode and be performed by them here in uh, the link. Uh, at 6 p.m. before the performance, we are going to have a small reception for them and we're inviting people, especially those in the cosplay community, to come out in your best Star Trek outfits. There will be a contest for best costumes. Uh, and uh, some of our guests uh, speaker, uh, he has friends, professional friends in the business of cosplay who will be here to help us judge some of these costumes. 
So we want you to think about coming out next week at 6 p.m. to join us in a reception for the Trek Theater and then a performance at 7 p.m. At 4 p.m. that day, there will be a lecture again by the artistic director, Christina Alibach, here on campus to discuss uh, the social justice aspects of Star Trek. She is the artistic director of the, the theater, and so she will be here early on to give a lecture in Milan Hall at 4 p.m. So next Thursday is Trek Heavy here at OSU. Uh, and then in November, our next event will be a panel of Native American artists, scholars, discussing the ways in which Native American people, right as now as we're entering into Native American Heritage Month, uh, discussing how Native American people have begun to under, try to understand uh, their lives and their experience in the United States through the lens of science fiction. So we have a Navajo painter by the name of Ryan Singer who tries to imagine Navajo life through the lens of paintings of Star Wars. Uh, Grace Dillon, who is a scholar who is one of the founders of the movement of indigenous science fiction in the United States from PSU. And an OSU alum, Joel South, uh, who is a hip-hop artist, writer, and video game programmer who tries to bring in his own Native American stories into the work that he does. So that will be in November 10th. But we really want to help uh, to generate some word about this. We'd appreciate it if you would spread the word with your friends. If you have interest in any of the events, we have posters in the back, and then you can also uh, shake uh, Captain Kirk's hand uh, in the back there, he has the poster with all of our events. And so, really want to invite you to please continue to share with us in the celebration of Star Trek. Okay, so enough with that. Uh, I want to turn uh, our uh, attention over to uh, our speaker today and to thank him for agreeing to be with us today. This uh, talk is a part of a much bigger sort of celebration going on here on campus, campus called Spark, which is the anniversary of celebration of the arts and sciences here at OSU and the ways in which these different disciplines, in fact, are not in tension, but in complementary with one another and, and require one and each other for progress. And when I was thinking about a speaker who would be able to talk really intelligently, but also in a really great public way about this matter, so I immediately thought of uh, Professor uh, Milstein here. Uh, Randall Milstein is a professor in the uh, College of Science, the Honors College and the College of Ocean, uh, was it Ocean? Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. There we go. Ocean, Earth, and Atmospheric Sciences, COAS, uh, and is a, a popular uh, professor uh, who uh, tries to talk about the ways in which science and scientists are portrayed in popular culture. And uh, I wanted to ask him, even though Star Trek is not his sort of favorite franchise, we've talked about this, we've argued about what's better, Star Wars or Star Trek. Right, Firefly. And Firefly. Yeah. <laughs> Firefly is good, though, I don't know about libertarian ideas and all that. Right. Um, we've talked about all of this. We've had long conversations in my office about the, the sort of different kinds of stories told in all of these franchises. And so when I was thinking about who would be good to help us to kick off some of this discussion about uh, the impact of Star Trek in our world, I thought of him. So I want to uh, invite you to help us welcome uh, Dr. Randall Milstein to discuss the cultural and technological impact of Star Trek in everyday life. Thanks, Dave. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, people always ask me, well, how do you kind of like this stuff anyway? Uh, my background started out as an art person, and it didn't explain the universe to me the way that science did. And so the, I ended up studying planetary geology, and it took three degrees in that, and worked as a planetary scientist for a long time, worked on Earth geology for a bit, and got interested in big things that blow up and destroy planets and that kind of stuff, and uh, ended up at OSU, and my office is in the Oregon Space Grant, where I'm the astronomer in residence there for all of Oregon. There's one, another one down in Eugene. There's two of us. So if you have questions about astronomy, especially things in the solar system, you can ask me, and my job is to help answer those questions for you. So I was always interested in this kind of things like Star Trek and Star Wars because they're inspirational. I was a young person when Star Trek came out, and it inspired me to want to be a scientist despite going to art school. Um, we're going to talk today a little bit about the cultural and technological impacts of Star Trek on where we are now. And as Joseph mentioned, uh, I usually go around and give talks, public talks, about how Star Wars influences our culture. And as I mentioned to one of our colleagues back there underneath this, I have a 
Firefly t-shirt on underneath my sweater. Um, but I have seen at least all of the original Star Treks, all the next generation Star Treks, and most of the Deep Space Nines, just when they were on television originally, and, and really enjoyed those. But there's a big question that comes up when you're looking at things like Star Trek, any show like this, and that is, what is science fiction? Well, science is essential to any work of science fiction. In fact, it's what science in a science fiction story separates it from other kinds of fiction. And the question becomes then, what about Star Wars? Is Star Wars a science fiction show? Anybody? No hands? What do you think? Yes. No. <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah, it's a fantasy, actually. It's a fantasy set in space because science is not essential to it. But thank you for answering, this is somebody else would. Um, it has the force. It has fighter planes doing banks and barrel rolls in space without any kind of air resistance against ailerons and other things like that. So the science is ignored. But it's a great story and we suspend our disbelief and we enjoy the tale because it's one that we're familiar with. But yes, yeah, Star Wars really isn't science fiction. On the other hand, Star Trek is different. Star Trek is real science fiction. Because it obeys what's called the laws of science fiction. These are come up many years ago in the 60s by two authors, Ben Bova and Anthony Lewis. And it says that science fiction stories are those in which some aspect of the future science or technology is integral into the story. And if you take that science out or the technology, the whole story collapses. So we can see that would happen in Star Trek very easily. The other thing is, is that science fiction writers are free to extrapolate any way they want from today's knowledge of what we know, and that changes every day, to invent anything they can imagine as long as no one can prove what they've imagined is incorrect. I think a really great example in uh, Star Trek is they go from zero to you know, warp 10, which is 729 times the speed of light. Uh, that would kind of blow your brains out. Uh, but they say we have inertial dampers. Now, we don't know what those are, but the fact that the writers understood the science and said we have to find a way to do this makes that legitimate by rule number two. And there's only two rules for good science fiction. Now, science fiction, like I mentioned, for me, was something I read as a young person. Uh, some students in my class were asking me today earlier, and I'm rereading books I read as a teenager right now to see if they still have the same impact on me. And the thing is, science fiction is a vital part of our popular culture. It is our modern myth, especially <coughs> in Western countries. Star Wars and Star Trek being part of that. It influences really how we look at our world and how we interact with technology in our world is based on science fiction. So shows like Star Trek, movies like Forbidden Planet, 2001 Space Odyssey, Contact, uh, I don't want to use things like gravity because they're kind of comedies, they don't fit into this. Um, they really influence people, and people then move into science professions as a result of seeing these. They get inspired. Yeah, I want to do like Jodie Foster did in Contact and look for SETI. Or why can't I be an astronaut like Matt Damon? You know, and they want to do those things. And that's good. That's an awesome byproduct. And Bill Nye, the science guy, will tell you. He was inspired as a young person by watching science fiction movies and reading science fiction books. Neil deGrasse Tyson, the same. Inspires you to move forward into science and engineering. So one of the things to think about with science fiction is this the literature of the human species encountering change. That's been the driving force through almost every science fiction story from Jules Verne, or actually Mary Shelley, in Frankenstein, forward human beings encountering some kind of change. And there's always been this really interesting two-way trade-off between science and science fiction, which science fiction often suggests some idea like, say, submarines, you know, or flip phones. And science takes off on that and makes it come real. But at the same time, science makes really interesting discoveries that become plot devices then for science fiction writers. And that's a real nice back and forth trade. Now, NASA has a program. Any of you who are literature people and are interested in science fiction, you can go down. We can give you some information from the space grant that they have a program. And at their space centers, there's multiples all over the country, they bring in groups of writers up to 20 at a time, and they're assigned mentors. And you're given a fellowship to go just so you can learn the science of what's the cutting edge right now. So when you write your science fiction stories, 
you're right there where the technology and the science is right now. And, you know, I think that's our government doing awesome stuff where we're letting writers go and intermingle with scientists and engineers. Now, the real interesting thing is that in some cases, science fiction has proven to be tomorrow's science fact. And I'm sure that's why a lot of us are here, to kind of talk about those things, or at least view them in terms of Star Trek. But the thing is with science fiction, <laughs> it doesn't set out to predict what will happen. It's more, more about human beings reacting to what if. A situation comes up, it's the change that's being documented. How do human beings react to that change? And that's what's really important. It's fascinating to see, though, that science fiction and reality sometimes converge, and sometimes they uh, take really different paths as well. Yeah, this is in Riverside, Iowa. They have a grave or birth marker for where James Tigetus <coughs> Kirk will be born on March 22nd, 2028. All I know is that I don't want to be, you know, I wouldn't want to be a kid who was male, born in that town on uh, that day, because there are probably going to be a lot of James Tiberius Kirks there. I, that'd be tough to go through life living up to that. Um, but here's a good example of that. Uh, some of you might know what this is. This is the Prime Directive, uh, Starfleet General Order Number 1. It says that there can be no interference with the internal development of alien civilizations by either direct intervention or technological revelation. We think, well, that's a nice idea, and that's Star Trekky and science fictiony. But actually, we do play to that in a different kind of way. We try not to interfere when we go into deep parts of Amazon and reveal technology to cultures that don't have things like steel. I know that here on Earth recently, the Russian scientific community drilled a hole through Lake Vostok in Antarctica. They know that the lake underneath has been covered for 11 million years. They don't want to contaminate the life forms that are in there. We had a talk, uh, Dr. Grotzinger was here last Tuesday night, was talking about the Curiosity rover. People were saying, well, we have these streaks on the sides of hills that we look like there's flowing water at different times. Why don't we go over and test that? Prime Directive. We clean those rovers before we send them off into space with alcohol and different kind of clean cleaners. If we were to go over there and contaminate <coughs> a virgin environment on a different planet, that makes us some pretty nasty alien invaders. So here's this made up <coughs> rule by Gene Roddenberry, with some good sense, that we actually have kind of assumed into what we're doing. We don't want to contaminate those. It goes back also to what's called Clark's Third Law. Arthur C. Clark, the famous futurist, then a telecommunication satellites. Clark's Third Law is that any new technology is no different than magic. And that's why we don't want to do this. You would totally write people out. We still have cargo cults in Vanuatu from the Second World War, where people flew in with planes during the Second World War. People never seen planes there. And it was a huge cultural shock to those people. And so we don't want to get into that type of situation. So I think, this is my me talking, that predicting the future is really a fool's errand, especially if we're using the brains of science fiction authors to do it. But uh, we can get hits of the future by reading and watching well-thought-out science fiction. And I think Star Trek <coughs> stories fall into that. They were, Gene Roddenberry did a pretty good job. And those stories and profoundly influenced engineers and scientists and futurists and technologists, designers. And they can alter our cultural zeitgeist, how we look at things, what we want to explore. It's one of the interesting byproducts is that we read science fiction books often and it's said that between 10 to 50 years are usually ahead of whatever the problem is going to occur. And if it's a 50-year problem, before it gets to us, say with technology or artificial intelligence, these writers in their imaginations and their humanities studies have sussed out a lot of those problems before they arrive to us. And that's a very powerful tool. They have 50 years to mull over the possible difficulties before we get to it. I'll show you some different pictures, but these are just some things that we always think about that uh, you want to say, oh, Star Trek, that's where those things came from. We have Star Trek data pads with two Ds, and of course we have think pads and iPads now, 2016. We have the original communicator from Star Trek, and of course we ended up with our flip cell phones that are now iPhones. We're going to talk about those later, they're even cooler. And this is what I think a lot of people miss. This is the master control panel for the next generation starship the big screen. 
know what that is? Yeah, that's the CNN newsroom. Yeah, it's the same stuff. He said, oh yeah, we can make a really big screen like that. That's pretty cool. Other things that we have, of course, <coughs> the original medical tricoders from uh, Star Trek, they go them over and you beam them. Now we have a portable ultrasound, medical scanners, the doctors use. You can also hook up to your iPhone. Now they don't even need a separate piece. It looks still like it's like a communicator. Uh, the Scandal Scout is another thing. You can take your body temperature, take your pulse rate, your heart rate, by putting on different places by this small probe that you can get. Looks just almost like the old tricoder that Dr. Crusher would use her Bones McCoy on you. Yeah. Um, the three things here, 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 and here, those are all real. Vaccine jet injection gun we have right now for giving you injections. The bioballistics gun is used for injecting isotopes and DNA strands for um, doing uh, melds of uh, plants. Mostly, you put radioactive isotopes and heavy metals and shoot DNA into a plant and change it. But we looked down here, EpiPens. Gosh, looks like Bones McCory's injector that he's got right over there, just 40 years behind. Laser surgery. Yeah, I gotta fix Captain Riker there, uh, Commander Riker's head. So he's that with a laser. We're using it to correct our eyes right now, and we're using it to do other repairs, if you've ever had a, a lance, they lance you with a laser, or to take off uh, <coughs> melanomas and skin cancers, we use lasers sometimes, as well as freezing them nowadays. Uh, bionic eye implants, Google Glass, Captain Cisco up there, look what he's got. This is what, 1990, Google Glass? Sorry about the picture being a little blurry. Jory LaForge's glasses, eventually he would have eye implants, as the series went on, the technology got better and he got better visors until finally he had eye implants, bionic eye implants. We also have cochlear ear implants now too, where you put the thing in your skull and wrap it to your so you can hear. Very similar to that. Uh, the Star Trek <coughs> bio bed. Awesome. Two different versions up here with McCoy in a little picture and the one used in the more recent Star Trek. And look at our MRI machines in our CT scanners. <laughs> Look almost exactly the same. So he said, yeah, we saw it in Star Trek. We decided we're going to make an MRI scanner, slide you through, take a picture of your body. Picture in the upper right, Star Trek. Put some equipment on your head. Next thing you know, reads out what's happening on your body, comes on a little screen. Well, those are health monitors. We see in every hospital room now, just about in this country, as a medical scanner. They hook you up to it, broadcast. Usually they put these on you. I had a terrible experience of having this done to me. And this will broadcast either out to a nursing station <coughs> or right to the monitor in your room, or, as you can see down here, a medical scanner, technically. Giving me heart rate, gives me calories burned, gives me steps walked. That's what this is. Right out of Star Trek, you think. I like these communication devices. Yeah. You know, in Star Trek, you just, Star Trek 2, you just hit it like that, and you can talk. Well, we have these badges, and you can wear them like that and talk. Or the Star Trek watch from the very first Star Trek movie, uh, Final Frontier, I think it is, with uh, the Viger. They had those watches like that, and this is what we have. Personal mobile gateway. And we have eye watches as well now. Where we can do things, all kinds of crazy stuff. 200 bucks. It's like Dick Tracy in the 30s. And it even gets more complicated. Look at Lieutenant Uhura's thing in her ear. Now we have <coughs> Bluetooth bows and other ones that we can put right there. Just tap, talk on the phone, hands-free driving. And I like this one on the bottom. It's brand new. It's a ring that you put on your finger. And when you want to make a call or listen, you unfold the ring. And it hooks over your ear. So that's pretty cool. Kind of fancy if you like that jewelry thing. Uh, this is my favorite, though, my absolute favorite. This was the Star Trek tricoder, especially the science officers would carry them and they'd go out and they'd take a geologic sample and put it in to do something or they'd take a biomedical read or do the atmosphere. I'm telling you, your iPhone or your Android is a tricoder. I'm sorry. This right here, I just learned recently how to use this. Yours, 
the <coughs> iPhone has an accelerometer. It can be used as a geophone to monitor earthquakes or any other kind of movement. You can literally put it on the ground, a series of them, and string them together, set off a piece of dynamite, and it would give you a, a geophone. The lines would be able to map out the density as it went around. We put it on a table, and I was just tapping out things as it did it. Um, it could be a medical monitor, just like the tricoder. With all your blood pressure, your health statistics on it, a dashboard for when you sleep, your calories burn. You go up, uh, up here, that's kind of switched around, but it also can give you weather conditions. So you can look anywhere you want. And if you have the right apps in it, you have night sky. And if you have a really good app and you're out in space, now we have a system where we use x-rays that are coming from other stars, and we can coordinate our position in space within three kilometers when you're out in depth, deep space. You can do it with your iPhone. Why? Because it's got a gyroscope on it and an accelerometer, so you can do that. <coughs> uh, again, solar charges, what's happening on Earth, solar storms. Uh, I can list all this stuff on it, just like a tricoder, find out where I am. Up at the top, worldwide weather conditions, just like I'm up in the bridge of the starship, and I can read some. I can do it on an iPhone. So basically, it's become your tricoder. And I think that is pretty awesome because that thing that Spock would carry looked like a really nasty transistor radio from the 1960s. And this is tiny. Hold it in my hand. So that's pretty amazing technology, way beyond Star Trek. <coughs> Uh, the universal translator that they use in Star Trek, so everybody in alien worlds can understand. Your phone does that too. You can talk in it, or somebody can talk in it, and it spits it out what it is, and even spits back the voice in English if you want it to. It's not, you know, E.T. coming to talk to us, but still, if we could do dolphins or something, I think that'd be pretty amazing. But right now, it's languages that we know and we can translate. Uh, this is, of course, the one I showed you very early on. There were versions of it back in the 1960s as well as the 80s and 90s. And of course, everybody knows the mythology and legend that Steve Jobs saw one of those and said, how come I can't have one? That's what I want. <coughs> so he said, his artist slash engineer slash artist scientist, make me one. And of course, Bill Gates had made kind of a version before and Mac <coughs> nailed it pretty good. But the bottom line is, is here they are, 20 years before. And we get inspired, move forward with that. Uh, visible teleconferences were in the original Star Trek. And of course, we now have those all over the place. You guys, I'm sure, Skype and FaceTime with people, just like they would do that in Star Trek. And of course, the phaser, this is a second generation phaser, and this is an actual taser. So even the shapes are similar. It's ergo, so that, that's fairly easy. Uh, talking computers. We would talk to the computer in the wall, and the computer would tell me the long range scan and where the Klingon you know, warbird is, uh, the Roman warbird. And on the other hand, we have Surrey. The first time I ever used Surrey was like a week and a half ago. It was awesome. <laughs> I had certainly been lost in Ben if uh, my co pilot hadn't had that. Tell me where I was going. Well, here's the thing. All those technologies I just showed you, we can suggest they're byproducts of Star Trek, but all those technologies in one form or another were pre previously part of the Jetsons, Lost in Space, and Johnny Quest. <coughs> so the question becomes, why don't we celebrate them? Why is this Johnny Quest week? Because, I mean, he was really instrumental in my growing up. I wanted to be Ben Quest, and I got there. <coughs> well, the Jetsons, Lost in Space, and Johnny Quest, the technology, number one, is almost always a nemesis. It's blamed for a problem. Uh, George Jetson's always screaming at Rosie the robot. You know, he's worried about the thing that the boss is going to see him in the bathtub because you know his phone can talk to him wherever he is. Uh, Johnny Quest, it's always some science thing that's gone kablooey, and his dad Benton's got to go stop it. And of course, lost in space. The whole reason they're lost in space is because the technology failed, and they can't fix it. And nothing works. That's opposite from Star Trek. Something goes bad. Chief McCoy fixes it. He's a pro. The ship's nice. It always works, pretty much. Um, I always like this picture, especially because this is from like 1964, before Lost in Space, and actually even before the Jetsons or early Jetsons. ThinkPad, computer monitor, even before we even had those things in real life. So that's really interesting. But yet we celebrate Star Trek for giving us 
iPads. Completely different line of thought. Well, of course, I'm going to go back and miss one thing there. And the other thing is, is that these shows, a couple of them are cartoons, but that doesn't matter. The storylines were good. Uh, never met a threshold of cultural introspection either, at least in my mind, where they look back at themselves and try to <coughs> have something that brought it all together at the end of whatever the adventure or the, the antics were. And that's different in Star Trek. If you ever think about Star Trek at the end of each show, it kind of goes full circle and you think about, they're thinking about what had taken place and whatever the events were in the story. Now, I like to think, and it teaches us too, that science fiction points out possibilities for us to consider. Again, it's about change, how humans deal with change. And it affects how we think. It might be really realistic star science fiction, like 2001, or completely fantastical, like the interstellar or gravity or something of, of that nature. But it has to be believable enough for people to see beyond the unbelievable part, the suspension of disbelief, and get to the core of what we are as people. That's when you have powerful science fiction. And it's examining our humanness from outside. <coughs> it's looking outside at us. And then it becomes really powerful. I'm sure people have seen these episodes with the Borg Queen, I hope. It's a very strong thing when you're dealing with Mr. Datus trying to find his own humanness as well and the captain losing his while somebody else is gaining it. That's a very strong, she's a very powerful character in that film. So Star Trek really is science fiction. Science is at the core of it. And this is the interesting part. It tells stories that really need to be told in real life, though, in Earth situations. But because of the time it came out, that was really difficult. There wasn't a television executive or even then censors who would have allowed those stories to be told in the 1960s if they weren't in space. If they were told on Earth, they'd have canned it. They'd have never been able to make them. Because it was poking some pretty pointy sticks at people about some subjects that were very raw and at the surface in our culture at that time. There was a lot of upheaval in 1960s culture in the United States. You had a youth movement that was very strong, a war in Vietnam. You had the, right, the fight for equal rights for people, especially of color in this country. And as a result of that, <coughs> you, you kept your hands off that stuff. But Gene Roddenberry wanted to tell those stories. So what you do is you put them in space, and you make them aliens interacting with people to tell those stories. And you've got to tell those tales that needed to be told for people. And that's really powerful stuff. Uh, the universe that Roddenberry made is interesting because it's a universe that's free, in his mind, of the burdens of capitalism and money. It doesn't exist. Uh, science has triumphed over technology in his universe, and basic humans have equality of goods, which is very important. No one has any need for certain things, like food, clothing, or shelter. <coughs> uh, it also suggests that if you educate yourself as individuals and you take your ego out of personal, interpersonal interactions, that a team can then focus on solving a problem of some kind. And that's always done for the collective good of everyone. It's not a selfish thing. And the message usually is one of the technologies progress manifests. Science moves forward, we build technologies. And as a result of that, you get an expression of social progress at the same time. And that's huge. But could you imagine having a TV show in the 1960s that said capitalism is a burden and that money is bad? Uh, that's not going to cut it, you know. Uh, not when we're fighting the commies, you know, and trying to stop this scourge all around the world, you know, imagined or otherwise. But it's interesting because Captain Picard explaining once, if I recall, this is to Q, that the acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. And that was his statement to, to an alien. This is why we do what we do. It's to the betterment of everyone, not a selfish thing. Now, I threw this in here just because I think these guys are hilarious as characters, the Ferengi, uh, who profit is everything. And as a result, their value system is, is quite bent in the storyline, where without profit, a Ferengi is not a Ferengi. There has to be something done a profit, and that means someone has to lose or lose something, which is a completely antithetical thing to Captain Picard. 
Now, I like to think about this, and Joseph and I were, were talking about this, um, what technological advancement might have made this possible? And I really think when you dig into it, and I've read a little bit about this, is that it's the replicator. If you have the ability to manipulate atoms to the point that you can make another replicator from the replicator that you made, you can make food. And once you don't have to worry about feeding yourself and your family all the time and fighting for fresh water, that's available. You have the ability then to spend time being educated. That burden is taken away from you no matter what your status in life is. And as a result of that, you can start to lift yourself up. <coughs> the individual doesn't have that burden any longer. And that's a real powerful tool. Some people say, oh, it's the warp drive and all this stuff. No, that's the byproduct. But once you have time to think about those things, you have the freedom to do that. And that everybody raises equally. But again, that's a message in the 60s that people didn't want to hear. You know, that's not the hierarchy of needs that we have, at least in our culture. So I think that, though, personally, that the essence of Star Trek is really an unapologetic optimism in faith and civic values that everyone can move forward and be lifted as a culture if we come together and do it. And where people that have different beliefs, or maybe they have different temperaments, races, even species in Star Trek, they work together. And that the theme always returns to relationships between the characters in the show and their shared qualities. That's what's different than the Jets <coughs> and Lost in Space and different than Johnny Quest. That wasn't there. And I always love this. I, this is a really sad scene if you're a fan of this show, but this always sticks with me. And it shows up as a reoccurring theme in the other Star Trek films and movies. I have been and always shall be your friend. That's the most important thing. That's the community that's built by the family of the people on that ship. That's their family. And that that's the most important thing. That always comes back around in Star Trek. And that's why it's poignant to our culture. We don't have enough of this shared feeling, in my mind. Now, Gene Roddenberry had this vision. This is George Takai talking. The Starship Energe Enterprise was a metaphor for the Starship Earth. And the strength of the Starship lay in its diversity coming together and working in concert. Kind of what I was thinking. Well, Roddenberry also said that until <coughs> humans learn to tolerate until we can value the diversity here on Earth, then we don't deserve to go out into space and encounter the infinite diversity we're going to find out there. There is something in science that we talk about. It's called the principle of mediocrity, the Copernican principle. We're just not that big of a deal. We think we're singular and unique. But we're going to move out into space, and we don't know what we're going to find. With the innumerable number of worlds that are out there, impossible diversity of life that exists in this universe. And until we're ready to respect that where we live, we don't have a right to go out and do that. We hear a lot of talk about, we're going to Mars. Boy, we're going to colonize that place, turn it into the new Eden. Scientifically, it can't happen, so forget it. But the bottom line is, what gives us the ethical right, prime directive, to go to some other <coughs> world and trash it like we did ours, all because we can't take care of the planet we live on right now? We're not taking that responsibility. And that's not a really good message to be telling kids and sending other people. That it's okay if we ruin where we live, we'll just go out and ruin someplace else. Tough. Tough question. I like this. That Star Trek uh, was really a self-fashioned vision, too, of successful multiculturalism, where racial, uh, ethnic, gender, sexual differences exist in some kind of changing harmony all the time. And it never tells us, though, and again, Joseph and I mentioned this before, too, how they came about that journey. It would be really interesting to see a series of shows, maybe this new one, we'll cover that. What was the history that got them from point A, where we are, say, now, to where they are? I'd like to know how they did that. And was it you know, brutal? Was it caring? Was it thoughtful? Was it you know, all-out war? What happened to allow that to go on? Because Star Trek also depicts interbreedings between humans and alien races. We can barely get people to shake hands in some places on this planet. Um, and I always like this, too, if you're real into this stuff. There is 
you look at one of the basic tenets of the Vulcan philosophy, where Mr. Spock came from, it's called Infinite Diversity and in Infinite Combinations, IDIC, which is an interesting concept. But it's a driving focus of Star Trek. Yeah, but all these people here are you know, mixed alien and human, or they've had human relations with, or with humans and they're alien. So uh, very interesting. These are characters we really look up to and respect for who they are and the qualities. Logic. <coughs> Honor. These are <coughs> strong, powerful human emotions. And, you know, it never stopped anybody from getting busy. So, and that was really played up. And you can imagine something like this in the 1960s, where you had situations where people on television could not even hold hands if they weren't <coughs> the same race. That was huge. And then to see it happen in the 80s, 90s, and late 90s. These are big cultural steps. Uh, I'll show you a picture in a little while. Kirk and Ruth had or her of it. This was actually the fifth same-sex kiss ever on scripted television. It was on Deep Space Nine. And of course, this famous one, the Kirk and Uhura, uh, which was actually the fourth kiss between different races on any kind of scripted television. Uh, very interesting. But Star Trek, I think, promotes a progressive set of social values that we can identify with. And it's gradually made its way into our modern society. And as Joseph, I had this wonderful conversation yesterday about progressive values and things in Star Trek that the number <coughs> of most fans of Star Trek, apparently, per population anywhere is in Oregon, followed by Washington and Alaska. I think that reflects our values, maybe, too. So. Very interesting. Um, but I like to look at it this way. I teach a course in the science of science fiction. We talk about aliens and how they're presented a lot in there. And I don't think it's um, what aliens are that's important, but what they represent that matters when you're dealing with science fiction and how we handle those aliens, which are the other. How do we deal with the other? And it's very compelling. I think it's a very <coughs> illuminating process, depending on the writer and what that premise is in all sorts of fiction. I don't care if it's science or to kill a mockingbird. You know, it could be Isaac Asimov's robot stories, or it could be Scout down in you know, the South. But you have all these aliens that show up, and they represent something to us. They're the other. They're different. They're not like us, either culturally, physically, emotionally, or mentally. And that's an interesting storyline then. Because at any time in history, if you want to know which group of people is really disturbing your society, look how aliens are portrayed in science fiction. This goes, of course, for Star Trek. There's lots of aliens. I'll show you some other pictures soon. But you look at how we represent people, how they're drawn out, what their <coughs> visions are, how we represent them and their characteristics as a character in the story. And things like these are not Star Trek, but they fly into this District 9. Those aliens are put into the Soweto ghetto in South Africa and set aside. Battle LA. The aliens could come to anywhere possible, but they end up in LA. It just happens to be this far north of the Mexican border. <coughs> so we set our story there. Flash Gordon. Uh, this is a poster from the modern version in the 80s, but he really came out during the Second World War. And Ming just happened to look Asian. Hmm, that was interesting. And of course, Predator, this is during the 80s, Ronald Reagan years, we're worried about you know, fall of the communists and everything going on. And then these, Invasion of the Body Snatchers and the Thing, 1950s. We don't know what they look like. The Body Snatchers are assuming they look just like us. That could be communist spies hiding with, among us. So they're telling this interesting story. And if you went back even farther, mechanical robots that look like marching fascists in the 30s. And in the 20s, interestingly enough, right after Darwinism <coughs> started to be really accepted, King Kong appears. <sighs> Genetics gone wild, craziness. So about every 10 years, our vision of what we're afraid of and who we're worried about changes, and our aliens change. So, kind of crazy. So Star Trek, I think, also goes against creating a clear line between us then, humanity, and them, which are aliens. This is one of the most famous versions of that story where someone's half black, half white, and it was half white and half black, and they couldn't come to agreement on anything. 
One was looked down on, the other not, depending on which side of their face was a white or black. This is a very huge <coughs> shout out to what was happening in the civil rights movement at that time right now, or at that time in the United States. And we also see this in the stories that are talking about race relations. This intermixing with aliens is about sexual freedom. You had a lot of those characters show up, almost look like um, green or pink or blue uh, peaceniks at the time, you know, dressed almost like the hippie culture. <coughs> and also any other culture, culture movement. You would always see them show up as versions of aliens on Star Trek, and then they would deal with this problem, and hopefully in a way that was resolute, and then in the end, move on. I think this is one of the most interesting. This came out in the late 1980s, early 90s, was the Borg. We are the Borg. You will be assimilated. Your biological and technological distinctiveness will be added to our own. Your culture will adapt to service us. Resistance is futile. And this was within three or four months after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So I think there's a lot of Reagan-Bush paranoia going on there, end of the Soviet Union. Expectations were being expressed of what we expected from those people. You will be assimilated. Your uniqueness will be added to the collective. And being capitalism, you know, open markets, open borders. So I think that was a very, very interesting <coughs> storyline to inject at that time. Tom smiled. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Well, a couple other characters I think are really interesting because they are kind of alien is Spock and Data. And I've had great discussions with students with, about this. I think they're a really excellent commentary on the human condition and what it means for us to be human because they're the mirror that reflects back to us. We're able to identify with them both because they look human even though one's an alien and one is an android. And we feel compassion for their attempt to gain humanness. And in their journey of learning that humanness and how it's expressed, <coughs> um, we can acknowledge that they're different, but we accept their outsider comment commentary on our humanity. We respect their view. I like to think that it's because they're both very logical and abductive reasoning driven in their science. They're both science officers and that we can respect their opinion about us. No matter what our foibles and our emotions might be, they reflect that back in a positive way that can be learned, and they absorb that as well. Now, I think that generations of people, especially since at least the 1950s, have been spiritually and intellectually, morally and ethically developed by the myth-making of science fiction. Really good science fiction. Things like Star Trek is a good one. Star Wars, the movie Alien, uh, Doctor Who, Firefly, Battlestar Galactica, and Blade Runner. And they've had a huge influence on our current cultural and our attitudes. Uh, one of the things I do when I talk about Star Wars to people is that there was a recent census in Great Britain, and more people marked down for spiritual belief as Jediism than Baptist, uh, Jewish, Sikh, Hindu, and Buddhist, and Muslim, Islam. That's kind of huge. Uh, if you want to see this, it is playing either tonight or tomorrow night at the White Side downtown, followed by Alien the next night. So if you want to see really good science fiction, <coughs> director's cut of this, uh, spend the two or three bucks and go down and spend a nice night at the White Side Theater watching it. Uh, it shaped our dystopian view of the future, too, especially for art direction for films and television. Thursday at 7.30. It's Thursday at 7.30 is Blade Runner, so is it Wednesday for Alien? Yeah, it is Wednesday at 7.30. Don't miss them. Classics. I remember when Alien first came out, I made the mistake of seeing it with a double feature with that and John Carpenter's The Thing. And I slept on my back to the wall for like two nights. Um, I think this is important too. It's not only the message and the visuals and the storylines, but the music of Star Trek has cultural meaning to us. When that theremin goes, whoa, 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 we know what that is when we hear it. We played at football games. You know, we, hear it, we had a concert here at OSU in, uh, earlier in the year of science fiction movie. This music was played. We know what that means when we hear it. Just like if we hear the Imperial March, we know what that means. You know, it implies something in our <laughs> cultural psyche. Well, I also like this. I like to think about words. Uh, certain phrases from Star Trek have become embedded in our language and they're cultural touchstones for us. And that's independent on whether you're a fan or not. Things like what a starship is. 
the word Vulcan. You know what that is. A tribble. You guys know what a tribble is, I hope. Uh, a mind melt. When someone says, beam me up, whether you watch Star Trek or not, you know what that is. What a Klingon is. How many people know what the Kobayashi Maru is? Yeah, my science fiction students are going to be doing that problem. <laughs> so they got to get ready for that. A red shirt. Uh-oh, why do I only have one red shirt, Captain? Am I? Yeah, because you're not going to need two. Uh, who Spock is? We say warp factor. We get in our car, we take a warp factor one to the Fred Myers. You know. Uh, deflector shields came out of this. What a phaser is. Photon torpedo. What the Borg. You know what a Borg is. Engage. You know. We know what that. Yeah, make it so. <coughs> Uh, who James T. Kirk is. You can say that people understand who he's the captain of the Enterprise. Resistance is futile. Set to stun. Uh, the Vulcan nerve pinch. You know, when you're little kids, you play that game and you grab your brothers and sisters and they have to pass out. Um, God! We hear that on ads now. TV ads that don't have nothing to do with Star Trek. People are screaming, Khan. We know what that is. Um, and then, of course, space, the final frontier and to boldly go where no one has gone before. Not just to go where no one's gone before, but to boldly go. You know, we're not going to let it stop us. We're going to move forward with this empowerment we have from what we've used our science and technology <coughs> to change our culture, to move us forward and explore. And that's what science is about. People always discover science is about exploring things, no matter what it is. And that's what this show is telling us. Now here's one. There have been numerous naval vessels, even the space shuttle called the Enterprise, but I can tell you right now when someone says the Enterprise, that's what you think about. That is the Enterprise. That's just the way it is. And this is one we all know too. Live long and prosper. And what's the reply to that? You guys know? Peace and long life. That's right. Peace and long life. 